Hey there, Commanders. Today I want to talk about thrusters, our little normal space engines that are oh so important to doing basically anything that you want to do that doesn't involve the frameshift drive. Coriolis is again our tool of choice for demonstrating the difference between thrusters and their advantages and disadvantages. With the profiles section down here being the most important tool to work with. So, anytime you buy a ship in Elite Dangerous, you usually end up with the E-rated variant of everything available. It's the worst of the worst. You don't want to have this. Uh, but like with all other modules, or most, I should say, other modules in the game, as you move up through the letter progressions, you get modules tuned for different specific attributes. The D-rated module, for example, lowers tonnage and performance in favor of weight reduction. So this is only two tons, where the E-rated is five, giving you a pretty significant gain. And you'll notice that in the process of giving you that gain, you also get a nominal increase in boost speed and normal speed as far as standard performance is concerned. <coughs> now, thrusters all have specific attributes that you should look at, namely their minimum mass, optimal mass, and maximum mass. Optimal mass gives you the best balance of, of everything. Um, hitting your minimum mass available doesn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing. You definitely care about your ship weight, but one of the things you'll run into as you approach minimum mass scale, um, with D-rated thrusters you won't see this, but as I go through the others, you'll, you'll notice that things will start to plateau as you get closer to this side of the chart. Uh, let's see. So D-rated are the lightweight thrusters. These are the favorites of explorers who only care about jump range and who are willing to make some transportation sacrifices in normal space in order to do so, which is actually a lot of explorers. One thing I want to point out, though, is you'll notice here the D-rated module has a very logarithmic pattern to the way that its power goes up. Um, but as I progress up through the C-rated module, now it gets to be almost perfectly linear, where reducing your weight continues to increase your ship's available speed. And then we hit 3B, where it starts to develop a curve. And then 3A, where the curve gets more aggressive. And you can't really see it very well, but there's a little teeny tiny plateau on this side I was talking about earlier. Um, <clears throat> As you improve your module's performance, you'll see here, optimal and minimum mass increase with the module's quality, which affects performance. Where when we were talking about shields earlier, the fixed attributes that had to deal with your hull mass would not change unless you increase the module's size. That's not true with thrusters. You can get a lot of performance differences within a module size by changing the module's category. And there's another little dirty secret down in here that you should be aware of that a lot of people aren't. These two bad boys, which are currently only equipable on small ships. So if you're new to this game, these bad boys are definitely something that you should investigate. But they are, however, only available, to my knowledge, from Professor Palin. So you need to unlock engineers just to be able to get access to these things. But then these little bad boys can be engineered on top of having different performance characteristics. And I'll actually go ahead and get in position to show you right now. Boom. Enhanced performance thrusters have the most aggressive performance curve of any thruster in the game. Um, since we're on a Viper and it can't take a size 3 performance thruster, you definitely want to be using the size 3s. But they are the same mass as a size A and as a size E. Um, just, to, just to follow the pattern, E's and A's tend to have pretty close to the same mass overall, but the A's have vastly improved performance. This has already been established. This is actually a really good way to illustrate how multipliers work in the game. Because you'll see this has a 115% optimal multiplier, and the rest of these modules, their optimal multiplier doesn't, doesn't do anything. Um, if you've ever played Kerbal Space Program, the optimal multiplier can be thought of as being related to the, the specific impulse of the engine, where standard thrusters tend to be really... Um, they have a higher specific impulse, meaning that they're really good at pulling higher loads, but at lower speeds. Rocket scientists, I'm sure, will probably want to get mad at me in the comments for probably getting that wrong, but I'm not a rocket scientist. Point is, and I'm going to go ahead and use automotive terminology because I think I can go ahead and get that better. Um, these thrusters are torquey. Uh, standard thrusters have a lot more torque. They can pull a lot more weight, but at a lot lower speed. Enhanced performance thrusters can pull a lot less weight at a lot higher speed, meaning that they are more sensitive to increases in your ship's mass than other modules. So if you use enhanced performance thrusters, it may not be a good idea to throw a bunch of B-rated modules in there if you were planning on it. Um, however, even if you combat fit a ship like this, you'll, with some 
adjustments still be able to get a better overall performance out of your ship than normal, especially as you add engineering on. We'll get to that in just a second. But this curve is something that exists across aerated modules in the game, though um, if I put the standard one on you'll see that the curve gets a lot smoother with a lot tinier plateau, depending on your ship's base hull and its uh, laden module mass and everything that curve is going to change positions. For example, if I go in here and I exploration fit this ship, watch the curve change. And I'll go ahead and slap 3A thrusters on here. The curve shifted upwards, indicating that the ship will be able to go faster because there's a lot of lightweighted stuff in here. Uh, let's see. If I do combat, this generally increases the weight of the ship. You see that our base speed and our boost speed are 339, 424. I'll go ahead and put enhanced performance thrusters on. And we go up to 395 and 494. So a significant improvement in base performance because the ship still, um, because the basic combat fit doesn't throw hull reinforcement packages in here, um, you see a dramatic improvement in performance all the way up to here. And this, um, when, you, when you highlight the chart in Coriolis, it gives you a little bar that tells you what the weight its calculation is based on. You'll note as we get up here, um, this number in tons is the total weight of your ship, including fuel, cargo, modules, everything. Once you hit about 68.8 tons, um, losing hull mass does not improve your top speed. And you'll see here the top speed is rated at 416 meters a second. So we're almost there. Now I've actually built a Viper that's specced specifically for maximum speed, and I'll go ahead and pull it up here comfortable showing it to you guys because um, it's it's not all that that practical. It does a lot of damage but there's a buttload of engineering and power play modules mixed up in here and basically what I did I built this to basically spin circles around fertile lances in PvP. It'll never kill a fertile lance. It doesn't have the firepower. Um, but it's super fast and super hard to hit. With a 700 meters per second boost speed this ship can actually outrun all of the missiles in the game. Um, with the right kiting and FA off, nobody will be able to get a shot on you, and you can basically just twirl around some dudes at like a kilometer or a half and give them a hard time. Um, but if he hits you even once, you'll note that the uh, hole is made of tissue paper, and basically you die if he gets a shot off on you. But you can have a little fun on your way to dying. That's the kind of ship you build when you don't, you know, kind of don't really give a crap about the combat system anyway. But this is the same story. I'm actually floating about right here at 80 tons, which you'll note is really close to the optimal mass for these thrusters, balancing maneuverability and top speed. I could probably strip this down a little bit more, but uh, the only way to do that is to lose hull reinforcement packages, and I'm to the point where I think that's probably not the best idea. It has an FSD interdictor for fun. Um, for the same reasons I think I talked about earlier, that sidewinders can interdict type 10s in this game, which I think is kind of nuts. I don't like it. This Viper can interdict ships that are many orders of magnitude bigger than it is, and um, I'll get into that in another video, but it's true of any ship in the game. Sidewinders can rip basically Imperial cutters out of slip out of a super cruise if you really feel like doing it. But most days I don't. I don't like to troll people that way. I usually just like to have one in case I want to help a friend pick on some other dude who's giving him a hard time, but you'd be surprised how rare those opportunities are. Most people who play Elite Dangerous are actually really nice and don't want to cause anybody trouble. So, yeah, let's see. Back to our original topic. Uh, depending on your thruster output and your end goal will affect to a certain extent the type of engineering that you do to thrusters, but there aren't that many options. Um, I've messed around a lot with clean drives, which are a favorite among people because, you know, I think it's related to, you know, clean being connected to being environmentally friendly. People think, you know, having clean thrusters is somehow um, less bad for the game's environment. I'm being facetious. In reality, actually, there's there's was at one point a huge debate over whether or not clean drives or dirty drives were better. Um, because clean drives reduce the amount of heat that your ship will produce when it's maneuvering, and dirty drives are basically just balls to the wall, everything you got all hours of the day. Easier to overheat when aggressively boosting, but the performance values are high enough that you can 
theoretically not have to boost as much. I won't really take, well, actually, I am going to take sides in this debate because I was one of the clean drive kind of guys. And I still do use clean drives on exploration ships and ships that I intend to fly in environments that will impart a great deal of heat on them, like close to stars or high gravity planets. Because if you run dirty drives with a drag drive tuning on a 9G world, you're probably going to cook your ship on the way to orbit. But that's neither here nor there. Most people aren't going to do that. Um, <coughs> clean drives. They increase the optimal multiplier, which is this figure right here. You'll note that stock thrusters have a 100% optimal multiplier. Um, no matter what size you pick, that multiplier just does not change. And it, even as you scale up, it's, it's the same pattern. Let me put my uh, Viper back on here. So, let's see. Put 3A thrusters on. If you do clean drives, you get a 23% optimal multiplier, which gives you a total multiplier of 128 and then you can go mess with a couple of different experimentals. I'll let me make an adjustment here so that you guys can see what these do to the curve. So if I reset this module, you see that the dotted line moves. And then I'll I'll start with clean drives and we'll, we'll work our way forward from there. But clean clean grade 1, clean grade 2, the line actually moves down meaning that your ship is to a certain extent losing some of its multipliers, but in exchange you're getting less heat. And as we keep going, you do get, like, the, the dotted line moves down on the chart because the band on the chart is increasing. You're actually getting better performance as you scale up. But there's a limit to how far you can push that. It stops at grade 5 and then you can either do thermal spread, which further reduces the thermal load of the thrusters in exchange for more mass, which might, it might lower yeah, you get like a 1 or a 2 degree drop in your maximum standard speed. It doesn't affect your boost speed. Drive distributors increase optimal mass, which affects uh, this figure right here. So if I stick that on, you'll see now it's 119. Um, I'll switch it back so that you can see what that does on the chart. It has a pretty substantial effect, um, but not as much as drag drives, which still bump the line down. But if you go up here... Um, you'll see that we're now boosting to 552 and 442. On clean drives, you're, you're basically okay. It's like you won't boost as aggressively as dirty drives will let you, but you can get somewhat close. But the 3A thrusters that are clean actually draw more power. And there are situations you'll run into where the increase in power draw actually completely offsets the, uh, <laughs> the benefit that you get from having cleaner thrusters. So generally speaking, if you're going to do clean drives, you're you're kind of committing to a, a clean build all the way around. Like uh, this tends to pair well with low emissions reactors, um, which are a favorite among explorers, particularly when they have slow fuel scoops. Uh, with grade five low emission reactor, you can uh, basically park yourself close to a star and never ever worry about overheating, long as you're not like, long as you're not spooning the exclusion zone, you'll be fine. Um, a lot of explorers who like to make stuff out of Imperial ships favor that especially because Imperial ships as a general rule run really hot. Not sure why I have set it up that way. Um, now we'll go over here and select uh, Dirty Drives. Which bump the line down but they change some of the chart attributes. You end up getting even more speed and boost per, per phase with Dirty Drives. And because dirty drives don't increase the uh, power draw as much, then sometimes you run into situations where, well, I guess it's kind of complicated. It depends on the build and how you set your reactor up. But m the overwhelming majority of people who do combat builds do dirty drives because it gives you the, the maximum top speed, the maximum boost speed. And if you go over here, you'll see um, as you compare the different uh, stuff that I've done in my video, these numbers go up too. You get more turning rate and, and more capability, and then you take that and pair it with uh, drag drives, which boost that even more. Now, there is a nuance that commanders should be aware of because of the way the math works on these thrusters. If you're using standard thrusters, the best possible performance you get is going to be dirty drive drag drives. Unless you're using enhanced performance thrusters in which case the best possible performance you can get is still 
grade five dirty drives, but you want drive distributors. Now we've actually exceeded the power plant capacity, so we'll make an adjustment there. Because of the way that optimal multipliers and optimal mass are calculated on enhanced performance uh, thrusters, you actually have the one exception to the dirty drive rule. If you try and stick drag drives on here, you'll see both numbers go down. And that's because of uh, the optimal mass improvement on enhanced performance thrusters. These are more sensitive to the mass of your ship than standard thrusters. So modifications that improve optimal mass greatly improve performance. And if you go in here, uh, and I'll give you another good example, I'm just going to drop all of the weight off our optional internals. Now we're at 729. That dotted line is moving closer to the plateau. We'll go in and we'll do D-rated distributor, D-rated life support, D-rated sensors. Getting really close. I don't think it'll let us get away with a D-rated power plant, but let's just see. Oh yeah, yeah, we can. So a D-rated power plant shaves even more weight. As the closer we get to this line, the higher these numbers are going to get until we get to, and it's calculating oh, about 67 tons. Uh, meaning that there's no, if you're doing a combat build, there's no reason to get the ship any lighter than that. And we'll take another off the fuel tank, and yeah, we're getting right up near that limit. Right up near the fastest you can possibly make a ship in this game. This is shieldless, this is without any of the other odds and ends. Oh, derated frame shift drive. Um, and we've arrived. From this point on, anything we do to make the ship lighter is going to make absolutely zero difference to the ship's top end boost speed. So when you're building a racing ship, that's what you would probably start with. You would strip everything down to the most basic and then add things as necessary. So it looks like we've got a couple of tons to play with. If you were building a racing ship, the next thing that you would want to do is toss in a derated shield generator, which takes us just over the tip there, and then you can go enhanced low power, low draw. And that gives you a reasonable racing ship with just enough capability to basically blow everybody's doors off. Um, this is the absolute fastest you can possibly make a Viper with no guns, no utilities, nominal shield strength, and a tissue paper hull. And all thanks to these enhanced performance thrusters. Just for contrast, I'll switch the standard ones on, dirty drive, drag drives, and you'll see that we've lost that upper performance plateau and it's back down to this curve with, anyway. That's thrusters in a nutshell. Now, I will add another nuance here. Um, if you're flying a big ship, like if you're doing a Type 10, because um, <laughs> it's a Type 10, um, the amount of impact you can have on ship performance is actually kind of limited. And this is a nuance you have to keep in mind whenever you're working with, with large combat ships in general. So I'll go in here and, you know, we've got a top speed of 184. Dirty drive drag drives, it gets us up to 260, but then as you start adding all kinds of junk in here and doing a full spec build, and I'll even go over here to one of my pre-built ones, I have this for fighting Thargoids. Um, the, the cost of doing this to a large ship, and the reason why I don't recommend dirty or clean drives on large ships is because, especially on ships like the Type 10, you've got a big fat ass and it's easy to shoot out. And uh, I've, I've had plenty of situations in Thargoid fights where my thrusters have started to fail and it kind of sucks. So um, when you've got a lot of engine space and not a lot of way to shield it, it's sometimes a good idea to just bag the performance improvements because, again, we're talking about, like, I'll go back to the stock Type 10. Do, 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 do. Dirty drag drives. Oh, hang on, these are E-rated. A-rated, dirty drag drives. 270 is not that fast. Boost to 331, eh, fine. You can still easily be outrun by every other large ship in the game, and at that point, there's just, there's not much point fussing with it, because it still turns like the Exxon Valdez, and it still doesn't go fast enough to really be worth a damn, and if your shields, which on this ship, because of the whole mass stuff I talked about in my previous video, it's really hard to get strong shields on a Type 10. You have to flip and lean into it as hard as you can. You're just not going to get the shield performance that you need to justify using drag drives because they lower your integrity. If I go in here and just select a standard A-rated, you'll see I get you lose 20 integrity sticking drag drives on. 
So if somebody gets behind you with railguns or missiles, it only takes like one or two shots to knock you out of the game. And once your engines are out in a PvP fight, it's over. Um, and, and actually, if you fight against spec ops in combat zones, those NPCs will sub-target you. And they will expose the weaknesses in your builds. After, like, we talked about this, but FDEV basically set them up to fight like players. They're not as good as players, but they use the same tactics. And I have died in a Type 10 to these guys in under a minute because I tried to go into the fight with an unarmed, unarmored power plant and unreinforced thrusters, and it was just a joke. I got, I got stomped. It was embarrassing. So if you're running a Type 10, um, do reinforced thrusters, and I would just recommend leaning into it all the way with double bracing. You do that, no one will ever shoot you out, and then add an armored power plant to boot, because uh, it's a Type 10. Um, the only way that you live through a fight is being too thick to die. So, um, let's see. Other ships with interesting thruster nuances. Oh, uh, the Beluga, because I guess we haven't got enough memes in this video yet. Let me find that guy in here. The Beluga has a phenomenal steering rate basically no matter what you do, but it's also one of the fastest large ships in the game. So, if you're going to do exploration or any kind of, uh, of travel build with it, um, it's dealer's choice. Um, but it handles like a medium ship at Super Cruise. So, give that some thought if you want to mess with it. And uh, in terms of racing ships and other ships, um, once you get up into a Cobra, Eh, you're, you're about at the limit. You can get a Cobra going pretty quick, though. I'll do dirty, drag drives. 630 is not bad. Um, the Viper and the Eagle and the Courier are going to kick your ass, but most of the medium ships in the game aren't going to be able to catch you if you're going that fast. So if you're in open play and you don't want to get ganked, um, cheesing your thrusters for maximum boost speed is not a bad strategy, especially if you know how to boost turn and uh, kite out of people's way. Because I think the fastest Fertilance in the game is 575 range. I don't think any of them have managed to find a way to do a build that's, that's combat effective at 600 meters per second. So all you have to do to outrun most of the PvPers, if you're in a small ship, is get your boost speed uh, close to 600. The Cobra can do it. Uh, there's a, a bunch of all of the ships smaller than the Cobra can do it with enhanced performance thrusters. You just got to be prepared to shell out for them because... Uh, the biggest you can get is 3A, and I think there's something like 2.5 mil. So if you're new to the game, they can be a tall order, assuming you even have Palin unlocked in the first place. But even the lowly Sidewinder, stick some 2As on this thing, nominal power plant improvements, and then engineer them, which I make sound easier than it actually is. Uh, Palin's one of the last engineers that you get to unlock. Drive distributors. That's 717 meters per second in one of the most maneuverable ships in the game. It's like the lowly Sidewinder gets made fun of all the time, but if you know how to fly this, you can make yourself really, really hard to hit. And with some of the power play modules, um, this is a free advice section, you can throw some size 1 power play modules on here to make this thing pretty competitive against other small ships. And in swarms, the Sidewinder can overwhelm larger targets. So don't underestimate these little guys. They're, uh, potentially dangerous. So um, that's thrusters in a nutshell. Um, if you guys have a particular topic you want me to cover, let me know in the comments. And um, if you think that I'm wrong about something or I screwed up some information, also let me know so that I can try to fix it. Cheers.